Tessék! Ja, hello! Good morning! Good morning! I see that our Hungarian students is sometimes switching on or off, so... I don't know who, uh, what is he waiting for, but... Uh, it's also possible, it's also possible, but what to do? Teaching on the internet is much more difficult than teaching in person. In person we can ask. Ah, he's here, it seems. And the last video was watched by 200 people. I don't, I don't know how. At least 200 people started. It's a huge number. As you are just three. <laughs> I, I'm not sure it's, it's English and not in Hungarian, maybe. So I'm a bit afraid of that, but who knows. When I was publishing some paper in English journals, I had claims from Chinese people. But I was publishing in English journals. The Chinese were reading it. I want you to come to, to I don't know which, uh, anywhere in China, in my school, to have a half semester teach, uh, teaching. Uh, no, no, I don't want. So it's dangerous to put things on the internet. You never know where it will be ending. Uh, Mr. Nassim, you have everything okay with the test at five o'clock? Could you do it? Can you do it? No. Okay, it's a short test. It opens at five o'clock and you get 20 minutes for the 10 questions. It's a multiple answer choice test, so. You've got a time window that starts at 5 and ends at 5.20. There's a time window. So if you don't make it during the time window, then you've got zero points of that. If you start it later, no problem, but for sure it will be ending at 5.20. This is what I used to tell Hungarian students. This is the Hungarian student system. They get similar tests. Okay, now let's try to start. <coughs> Welcome to everybody. What you see here is the fifth week lecture of the drive techniques topic. And last week we were talking about uh, two-stroke engines. 
and how two-stroke engines look like, what are the internal interesting things. And we have finished more or less the gasoline engines. So what is left actually is the diesel side of the two-stroke engines. And I'm afraid it's as, more in as interesting as the, as the gasoline side. Uh, what I will tell you is mainly a short overview of the principles. And as the internet is big and it's full of interesting facts and uh, uh, videos with small cats, you may also find videos with such engines, either dismantling or history or so on. So you can find a way yourself if the topic is interesting for you. Okay. So the topic today <coughs> is the two. Opa, I'm losing my papers. Two-stroke diesel engines. Ooh, in Hungarian, it's small d, but in English, it's maybe capital D. So we start with two-stroke diesel engines. We were talking about it two weeks ago, maybe, and we are talking about uh, about engines, auto cycle, and so on. Shortly, in a nutshell, for those who are not present, uh, diesel, archaic, very old layout. Uh, basic problem was when I say archaic, very old, I say it's around 120 years ago, okay? So later, late 1980s, early 1990s. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. It was late 1890s and early 1900 years. Roughly. So the basic problem was, as a diesel engine admits pure air and the fuel is injected inside during or at the end of the compression stroke, so you get limited time window for air, fuel, mixture, making. You get an engine that turns at, I don't know, 100 by minute. And in 100 by minute, you get 100 times two up and down motion of the piston. And at the end of each compression stroke motion, you have to inject a small quantity of fuel in the engine, which requires a quite developed hardware, let's say. And uh, it was not the case for the early engines. What was the solution of that? Solution was that <coughs> they used a compressor. compressor for uh, making small uh, diesel oil drops. And these small diesel oil drops were entered in a, in a cylinder by, I don't know, by the main inlet valve or by a supplementary valve, but still the mixture making was not made entirely inside the combustion chamber because there was no such device that allowed to pumping in the oil at high pressure in small droplets. So these machines were one cylinder machines with huge flywheel, as you see in nice pictures of old machines, but they were at least working and they had much better efficiency than the steam machines at that time. We were talking about also some weeks before. Uh, let's hope you get the normal and good voice. So if you get voice problems, please let me know by a chat message. 
and I will control the things here. I'm not alone to use this device, so sometimes the settings are changing randomly. Sorry for that. So, you had a compressor for making small diesel oil drops, and for that, valve, valve, uh, valves are required. And so you had four stroke machines. And it was mostly 120 years ago. And as we, the people at that time had a new machine with a very, very good efficiency regarding the contemporary steam engines, they wanted to use it everywhere if possible. So there were seeking for solutions to, to solve the mixture making problem. The gas oil or diesel oil is much heavier, much thicker, has higher viscosity than the, than the normal gas that you add to a car. And uh, it's very difficult to make a, a steam of, 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 of this thick oil that allows the combustion easily. So first idea was to make a comp to use a compressor for a first vaporization and then the second stage happens inside the cylinder. But there people were seeking for cheaper solutions. And the cheaper solution was what we call a hot bulb system. Hot bulb engines. The hot bulb engine system is a kind of two-stroke engine system as it uses the piston for making the compression partly in a crankcase pump, as we have seen for gasoline engines. The size is larger because it's, we are talking about diesel engines or they can also be called semi-diesel engine. Semi -diesel. So halfway between uh, gasoline engines and diesel engines. And what are the specificity of these kind of engines? The hot bulb engine system, it's a solution for the DSL fuel mixture problem, fuel mixture making problem. How is it working? It uses a crankcase pump for admission. The gas flow is made through ports. So there are just no valves. You get ports like in a two-stroke gasoline motor. You get admission port, exhaust port, plus a transfer port or scavenging port for putting the, the gas from below the piston to the top, to above the piston. Uh, so no valves. And also quite interesting, a uh, hot bulb engine has got a very low compression ratio. You used to have high compression ratio in diesel engines, but here you get a low compression ratio. Which, in the, which is in the order of five to six. For a normal uh, diesel with no turbo, you get 18, 20, 22, depending on the, uh, on the construction of the engine. For a hot bulb, you get five to six. Five to six is really low. Uh, you get the lawnmowers, the Briggs lawnmowers and company. And these are these machines that have such low 
compression ratio. But if you know that the diesel engine works by, comp uh, by compressing the air and injecting the hot oil in the air to burn, how you get, how you can get a, a normal combustion in these systems. And the trick is that instead of using mechanical energy to make droplets of thick oil to start the combustion, you use just heat. You get a hot bulb. Okay. How you, you use it? You get a combustion chamber uh, which has a material of high thermal capacity. That means it's made of, the combustion chamber is made of material that conserves the heat. Heats up slowly, but once it is heated up, it keeps the temperature. And this is an essential element of these type of, of engines. So, the material is usually cast iron like an oven, a <laughs> normal oven, or heating plate, electrical heating plate. Maybe also can be copper or bronze, but they are quite expensive for such, such purpose. Uh, and the injection happens at low pressure. in thick flow. Like using a normal medical uh, setting injecting device. And how the droplets are formed? Just by boiling <laughs> on the hot surface. Okay, like when you are cooking your, your sausages, the same. And one more thing, as the heating and the boiling requires time, so time is needed for heating up the injected quantity, so injection time is to one half to three quarter crank turn before. Uh, compression. Okay. So you get a spectacular delay and a, a huge time for, for, for heating up all the oil. So maybe I will make a short sketch. You get the piston you get a normal cylinder head, compression chamber, plus you get a really large internal chamber connected to the combustion compartment with a small narrow entry. Okay, and the injection goes somewhere here on the side And as you get a quite narrow entry to the chamber, if there is no too high pressure inside or above the piston, it can work normally. And this thing is hot, hotter than the piston, the other, in, uh, other parts. So the piston is moving, going from down to up, compressing the thing, compressing the air, putting the air inside the chamber, while it is full of, of, of mist, of oil. And the piston going upwards, add air and air and air, 
till the point when you get an air fuel mixture, which is heated up so you get small droplets, plus you get enough air to start the combustion. And once the combustion has started, the fuel pressure and the, 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 comp uh, and the burn gas pressure increases and goes out of this small chamber, goes in the big chamber and pushes down the piston. Okay? Yeah, it's the hot bulb. This is the hot bulb. Yeah. And it's not really small. As you see, it has got a very low compression ratio that says that this is like the point in, model, in, in larger engines. So it's relatively large, major part of the, of the comp uh, compression chamber here. Okay, why do we need so large chamber? That's because the heat goes through the surface. And larger is the surface, larger is the volume. Okay, but here you can burn almost anything from normal petrol to diesel engine and even thicker oils if you are not lucky. So it burns almost everything, but you require, it requires time to heat up the thick oil. Okay, so it was a quite cheap machine that was, that could use almost anything for fuel. And then, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. And you say the heated gasoline <coughs> starts to burn at the end of the compression stroke. Okay, so the start of the ignition is like in a classic diesel engines. Small drops, heat, enough oxygen in the combustion chamber, and it starts automatically. But at the beginning of the injection, you got very little air inside, very thick mist of, 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 of gasoline, and unless you, do, you push the air inside, there's no combustion. Just a mist of, of fuel. So small or larger or smaller droplets. Uh, the question arises how you can start such engine. It has, uh, the hot bulb engine has got a particular starting procedure. Namely, you've got to heat up the hot bulb first. Heating up the hot bulb is required. required how by any external heat source heat source okay so usually either you you pour on it a bit of gasoline or petrol <laughs> you burn it and you wait five minutes to ten minutes so that all the hot valve had a uh, a temperature of let's say 200 degrees Celsius or something like that. So it's not a, not a quick thing to start. And time by time you inject a bit of gasoline to see how it is evaporating, vaporizing. We got very nice videos on, on YouTube on that, on these type of engines. And you, you get a flame of, I don't know, of 22 centimeter going out of the watching hole. Then it's hot enough. And then what are you doing? You just seek for a crank and then start by crank lever. So you turn a bit 
and it starts quite easily. Uh, there are other tricks because it has no valves, so it can start either in one direction or in the another direction, and it happens more than once. So once it has started, you have to check <laughs> in which <laughs> sense of rotation is <laughs> rotating, and if it's not the one or the, the right one, then you stop it by switching off the gasoline or the diesel oil, and you have to stop it, start it again. Okay. What are the advantages, advantages of such strange engine layout? You have solved the problem of, of mixture making, for sure. Even, this is not really, not really, mm, no. There are no large requirements for the fuel, so you can burn any thick oil you have, petrol or, or diesel oil or any other oils. And once it started, you get a stable RPM level. So it goes at the same RPM all day long. Once you added the cooling and you added the, the fuel in large quantity. As there are not so much parts inside, you have low need for maintenance. You have no valves. You have just a crankshaft, a piston, and a cylinder, nothing else. Even no complicated injection system, just nothing. And sense of rotation can be uh, reversed. Uh, from the point of view of road vehicles, it's not an advantage. But if you are thinking about, for example, railway vehicles or ships, it's often a requirement that for changing the, the, the way of going, or rails, for example, you've got to make something to start in the opposite direction. And this one goes by itself. The same in, in ships. Sometimes you have to go backwards with your ship, uh, with your uh, ship, so then it's quite easy. Uh, the disadvantage, slow starting. when hot or when cold, sorry. And even this one is relative because if you consider a steam engine, a steam locomotive, for a steam locomotive, you've got to make a fire in the boiler, you've got to heat up water. <laughs> so for starting a steam locomotive, you need one hour of work before you can start the locomotive as such, before you get enough steam for uh, making uh, the locomotive work. While here, you need just 10 minutes. But regarding to a normal gasoline engine or, or, or modern diesel engine, it's much more. For a conventional Mercedes, you, old Mercedes, you start, you turn, you turn your key, you are waiting for the, uh, for the glow plugs, you check the glowing color, if it's red or not red, one, two, three, blah, 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 you, you count till 60, and then you can start. Here you can, you, here you have to count till 600. <laughs> That's the difference mainly. Okay, and also you get a problem with the efficiency. So the efficiency here is less than for a normal diesel engine, much less because you get smaller compression ratio, which is directly linked to the, to the efficiency but still better than for a gasoline or petrol engine. It's better than a spark ignition engine, okay? And these engines were really, really, really popular, let's say 100 years ago, 
they were used in railways for small locomotives, but mostly they were used in tractors for cultivating lands for agricultural purposes. And also they were used in ships, small fisher ships. In one cylinder unit, two cylinder, three cylinder unit, not more, because they were easy to maintain, they were quite cheap, and they were running on everything you can find. Maybe fish oil or I don't know, <laughs> whale oil or <laughs> anything you had. Okay. So applications. You get tractors, and also you get uh, ships. And tractors, they are quite popular uh, names in, in Europe. You have, for example, Lance Bulldog. Which is a German tractor maker who made small tractors for small farms. One cylinder, five liter, three liter, five liter of volume. <laughs> the typical antique tractor sound you had. Also you get in England, you get hoff hair. Schrantz. Or not for fair, this is a Hungarian one. So you have more of the Clayton settlers. Uh -huh. You had Clayton settlers in England. And in Hungary, you had also, you had a tractor like that. It was the hof hair, which, which was a license of Clayton Settlers. In Hungary, you had a hof hair. Later on, it was called uh, Red Star, but it was after the communist. Okay. If you seek for Lance Bulldog or Clayton Settlers in, in the internet, you will find a lot of, lot of tractors. And if you seek for hot bulb, uh, ship engine, again, you will find a lot of videos on, on ships with such engine. Unfortunately, I cannot have you an example, I cannot give you an example of ships because I'm not expert in, in ship engines, but I have seen very nice videos. Okay, so usually when you meet an industrial problem, you've got, and you've got more than one way to solve it, at least for a short time, every possible way are explored and there are solutions for every possible way. These days you get the battery storage, but energy, st energy storage by batteries for, for the electric vehicles. You've got different kind of, of batteries used because we don't know which will be the dominant, which will be easy to manufacture, cheap enough to sell and small enough to put in the car and having, which will have uh, a capacity large enough to store a lot of energy inside. So every five years you get new and new new technologies. And it was the same time 100 years ago with the, the diesel engine logic. So, meanwhile the people were happy with the hot bulb engines. The big research institutes were working and they were developing the high pressure Uh, diesel injection. When I say high pressure, that means that compressor was no more required for, for injecting the, the fuel, but there were specified device that could make droplets small enough in a short time with a, short, with a small quantity of, of uh, fuel that allowed the, modern, the birth of the modern diesel engine. Okay, and it was around the 1920 till 1930 in this period, the 10 year period. You had the mechanical principle, pumps, mechanical pumps, 
uh, you get high pressure. Let's say from 150, 150 to 180 bar of injection pressure, which is high. So such, such uh, flow can easily enter under your skin, even if it's a fluid by its own pressure and speed. And uh, uh, making of small droplets is possible. And what else? And not only it can make small droplets, but it has also quick working, quick uh, working. So they, these system, these injection systems could inject small quantities in small droplets in a short time. And if it's possible to have an injection in short time, then the RPM of the diesel engine could increase. So from 80 to let's say 500 or to 1000 would be optimistic case. So it is a huge step forward in the diesel technology and the makers or early systems you had Bosch, as you know, for sure, the Bosch systems for diesels. You get also Sims, which is English. English had a lot of ships by definition, so they required a cheap engine, cheaper than the steam engine. So Sims was developing a system in England. You had L'Orange in France. It was more for uh, railway vehicles and, uh, and also mini ships. And there were the Hungarian Jendraschik that made a system, his own system in Hungary. These were the early injection systems. The principle was common, it, they, were mechanical, they were using mechanical pumps and the injection pressure was around 150 to, to 180 bar and they allowed to increase the RPM of the diesel engines and if I'm talking about increase of RPM, I'm talking about increase of power. So before the large diesel, diesel engines were large and heavy to put either in ships or in Power, stable power plants next to a manufacturing uh, plant and nothing else. With the high pressure, they could be small enough to put, for example, in locomotives or in tractors. So it was a huge step forward and it was a, such a good technology that from the 30s till the 80s it was used. So if you get the old Mercedes, the old diesel Mercedes, it's using for sure the Bosch technology. That, was, that has been elaborated in the 20s. Okay. So. Yeah, 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 it's, it's higher. RPM, higher power and higher, uh, higher and smaller volume and size. Weight, volume. 
So this was the start of the locomotive in either locomotive era. Note that in my country here in Hungary, we were among the first, so we were among the first to use electricity in locomotives. And also we were among the first to use diesel engine for locomotives. As we had our own system, thanks to Mr. Jan Rasik. Okay, 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 okay. But still, we needed further problems. So we had the high pressure injection for diesels, so we could make an engine with high compression ratio to have very hot air in a small compression chamber so that we could inject the small droplets of fuel and it started quickly, quickly, let's say one minute of blowing, you count till 60 and then you start to crank your engine, okay? But we have high compression ratio required. So we had problems with heavy parts because they had to resist the high compression ratio. And uh, again, we met a second RPM limit. If you get a piston that weights three kilograms you cannot reach too high RPM, but you need a piston of three kilograms to reach a high uh, peak pressure in your engine to have high power. Okay, so typical diesel engines of this era were going till 1,500, uh, 2,000 RPMs, which is a huge jump from the 500 of the hot bulb en engine. It's a huge jump, it's four times more. But still there's a limit. And in this case, we are talking about the 1930s, 1940s. We had new solutions that arrived. And now, not on the injection side, but on other other domains. The f in the 30s, 1930s, this was a period full of development. If you think about nuclear technology and the race for the atomic bomb, in the same time, there was a spectacular development in the flow dynamics, flow mechanics, and also relative to the flow mechanics in turbo machinery. So the compressors and the turbines, mainly gas compressors and gas turbines, with also a spectacular development. This is the time of the birth of the first gas turbines. In the late 1930s, both in England and in Hungary here, in this country also, we had the first gas turbines working. Not in airplanes, but in the, in the land, as experimental devices, but still. Uh, and the knowledge, you remember, you had the ra rocket knowledge that went into two-stroke engines for the small motorbike engines. You also have the knowledge of the gas turbines that went to the two-stroke, now, diesel engine. Okay, some words about that. So, uh, 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 solutions to, to power increase requirement and now comes the interesting things. What we can do is if we go back to our basic formula of power we were talking about two weeks ago, maybe. We can increase 
the indicated pressure, Pi, increase. So we have to put more air in the combustion chamber so, so, that, so that we could put more fuel in more air and we can have at the end more power. Uh, we can use a mechanical compressor. When I say mechanical, I omit here mechanically driven compressor. So you put something on the end of the crankshaft and the crankshaft drives a compressor. These compressors that time were quite simple. They were volumetric ones. Like roots compressor. Maybe we heard about that. This is used in the American VH engines. Or you get the solar roots, it has got gears it's a gear special gear pump that has two gears that's it's a pair of it's a pair of gears that has just two teeth and you get a large gap between the teeth and in this large gap you trans you you, uh, you make the air move inside the engine and if these large teeth or two spare spins quickly then you can pump more air in than the natural radiation of the of the system. And solar, solar uses sliding blades. You get a rotor, you get four, two, three, four blades. And the rot well, it's easier to draw maybe. Solar is really easy. You get a housing, cylindrical housing, and you get a rotating rotor. You get eccentricity between the two shafts. And you got flying blades. And the blades are put radially in the system. And they are sliding outside on the cylinder outside. If you turn this rotor, then the blades go out in out in out in wide turning. And bit in the in the in the volume. And the volume between the blades goes from one side to the other side. This is a solar compressor. For a Rhodes compressor, you don't have to use lubrication because the teeth of the special teeth are not touching each other. For the solar, as you get blades that are sliding on the external cylinder surface, uh, you've got to use some, some lubrication in the system. So this could be put on the early diesel engines, but it was not really good at low RPMs. So the <coughs> consumption was high at low RPM and the power increase appeared only at high RPMs. So it was not a good con um, uh, solution. What was better <coughs> was what we call actually turbo compressor. And the turbo compressor, as you know, consists of two uh, machine based of fluid mechanics. You get, at that time, you had a centrifuge compressor, a centrifugal compressor, and you had an axial turbine. And again, this thing went together with the development of fluid mechanics. As people were studying compressors and turbines and increasing the efficiency of both machines, if you f put first a compressor and then you put on the same axis a turbine, you can, con you can build a jet engine or a gas turbine. If you put first 
a turbine and then a compressor, you get the turbo compressor. It's a question of order, which is first, which is driving the other. Okay? Uh, this is what we have, and if I'm talking about turbo compressor, you don't have the tinies that we have today, but we have a bit, you have a bit larger scale. So it's not 10 millimeter, it's 10 centimeter. Because they are large engines, they were large engines. Uh, yeah, we are talking about 1930s. And the other solution, and we are on our initial topic, it was uh, the increase of work strokes in two tons. So we get, again, uh, the so-called two-stroke working, one work stroke in each crankshaft. How is it possible? We have seen on the uh, gasoline two-stroke engines, and we have also seen the hot bulb engine, that we can use a loop scavenging So the Schnurle system. So in this case, you get a crankcase pump where the admission happens and there's a partial compression in the crankcase and you get a scavenging port and the air going up to the above the, the piston through the scavenging port. This can happen even for diesels, this is what we find in the, in the hot bulb engines also. But here we are talking about normal diesels, regular diesels. And it is used in small stationary engines. So garden, garden industry engines, agricultural engines, but very small size, 150 cc, 200 cc, 300 cc, it was used. Uh, it was used also that time, I'm talking about the 1930s, uh, used in large engines, larger engines. I have to mention the autobus maker. It's called the Grave and Stift. Grave Stift bus engine. But it was not really common to use uh, this type of loop scavenging and and, uh, and the crankcase compression in larger engines, other than the hot bulb. There's one example that I, I have found in the Grafenstift bus engine. This is an Austrian, Austrian bus maker. And it had this kind of engine. Uh, for the loop scavenging and crankcase pump for diesels, the basic advantage was that uh, the basic advantage was that 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 the sense of rotation still can be changed, can be reversed, and there was a constant disadvantage if you wanted to make serious heavy large uh, powerful engines with crankcase pump you had a problem of lubrication lubrication and also bearings lubrication and bearings why 
because if you get the air through the crank case, you have to solve the oiling somehow. In gasoline engines, motorbike engines, you add, first they admit air fuel ratio inside the crankcase. If you add oil to the fuel, you get a kind of lubrication inside. Not a strong one, but some. If you have diesel working style, you add just air. So you have to pour in oil droplets somehow to, to get lubrication inside uh, your crankshaft and, and piston and cylinder, which is difficult. So you need a separate oiling system. And the second problem, even if you get a separate oiling system, you can use mainly rolling bearings. And the lifetime of rolling bearings and the load carrying capacity is usually in a given size, if you get a size that you can use, is slower than for journal bearings, plain bearings. So there was a problem how to have long lasting and strong journal bearings for a diesel engine plus high RPM or work stroke in every, in every rotation. And for that, we had more current practical solutions. And the first one was what we call opposed piston engine. The opposed piston engine. What does it mean? So what we like in a engine where we have no valves, instead we have just ports opened or closed by the piston, we really want to have a flow that goes just in one direction in the cylinder. And there are no loops or not too much loops or not too much uh, whirl inside, but there's a quite continuous flow from the inlet till uh, through the exhaust. And how an opposite piston engine make this? It's really interesting to see. I try to make a sketch to explain. You get a cylinder which is empty on both ends. On the side you get admission, you get exhaust. And what do you have in the lower end? Here, let's say you get a piston, as usual, plus you get a crankshaft, you get bearings, you get a connecting rod, as usual. And what does it mean, opposed piston? It means literally that upwards, you get a second piston. And a second connecting rod. And a second crankshaft. And these two crankshafts are joined together by a series of gears so that they move in the same time towards each other and away from each other, towards and away. Okay? Mm -hmm. The air is going in, it is compressed, so all the ports are closed, it's compressed, and the injection, the injection happens usually on the middle, on the side because you have no other place to put. Okay. The efficiency can be good because you get a large surface where the burn gas can, uh, you get large surfaces that the burn, ga burn gas can uh, push away, uh, but you get two crankshafts. It's a bit heavy, it's a bit heavy. 
but the efficiency is not so bad. And from a structural point of view, it's quite simple. You get one more piston, one more crankshaft, one more connecting rod. Yeah. It's a bit tall, yeah, for sure. It's a bit tall. And you can have a normal, regular oiling system, both down and up. You can use your plane bearings, Jonah bearings. So you get a huge lifetime. And no valves at all in the system. Okay? Here, usually, you get uh, blah, 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 blah. Here, you get <coughs> a delay between cranks, uh, the exhaust crank, has five degree advantage. So it's not perfectly uh, in synchron. And that's because it opens the exhaust a bit quicker. So if the exhaust flow has started, it helps the admission at the other end of the cylinder. Okay. Uh, the cranks are link joined, linked by gears. So there's a complete gear train on the side of the engine block. It's noisy, for telling you, it's noisy. And uh, it works quite well. It works quite well. There's also a second variant of that using just one crankshaft, but still opposed pistons. In the second variant, I need a, one more sketch to, to draw it. Uh, one more sketch to explain when, what happens with the opposed piston engine with one crankshaft. So opposed piston engines opposed piston one crankshaft how it looks like if I'm watching on the side I'm watching the system on the side I get the cylinder somewhere here let's say I get inlet ports below I get X exhaust port above on the cylinder wall. Actually, you can have a large number of ports. It's just symbolically to show you. And you get a piston here, a piston here, and you get a piston pin, a crank, a connecting rod, and you get it here. You get the crankshaft. And what else you get? You get a second piston here. A second piston pin. What else? A second small connecting rod. A large pin that goes longer than the cylinder diameter. And on these large pins, you get two long <laughs> connecting rods that go here. Okay, is it clear? Long connecting rod that goes here. Here, <laughs> do you see? And if these parts are, let's say, 300 millimeter tall, they are really heavy because the compression should make should be made here in the middle. So the force, the pressure force, goes in this loop. 
okay? And this also has been made for more than one, more than one time. Note that the opposed piston engines were developed by the Germans as a diesel technology, basically. And the opposed piston engine as such was used for the first by, I'm just seeking for my papers, yeah. It was used or developed by, developed by, by Junkers. And you know Junkers was not only a diesel engine developer, he was mainly developing these engines for his airplanes, for bombing airplanes, bomber airplanes, because bomber airplanes are the trucks in the air, they are carrying heavy weight for a long time, so the efficiency of the engine is very important. So such engines were put in bombers. Do you imagine? Air, uh, uh, an airplane starting with black smoke <laughs> and diesel sound, but still it was quite efficient. It was tall and heavy, but uh, for its power it was not so heavy. And for a bomber engine, that bomber airplane that goes long distances with heavy loads, the consumption is, is very important. And diesel engine by itself has low consumption, lower than a uh, a contemporary uh, gasoline engine. And so here, the admission made by Roots compressor compressor. So here, when the port is open, you had not so much time to wait the air to enter. You use an external compressor to push as much air inside as you can. And even you can push in so much air that a small portion goes out by the exhaust, no problem, because it's pure air. So in, in gasoline two strokes, you have a problem of that, that, that the fresh mixture goes out with the exhaust. In diesel, there's no problem because the fresh gas entering is just pure air. So you can really clarify all the volume of the system. And then when the pistons close the ports, then you can inject your gasoline, your diesel oil, sorry. Okay. So these engines are not only tall and heavy, but there are also a gear chain linking either the two crankshafts or, or they are heavy connecting, secondary connecting rocks, connecting rods, plus you get for sure a compressor, a large one, because it has to push all the required air in the system. But it's still working. So application airplane engine. And there is a further development of this opposed piston engine, which is quite tricky. So I, sorry, before I forget, advantage. Good lubrication. Long lasting bearings. good efficiency. Negative thing, tall engine, and what else is negative? Noise. The noise that comes either from the port 
the presence of ports, so the flow dynamics, flow mechanics, and also the diesel working so principle. Okay. And the ultimate type of this was developed by the English in the 40s. How to say? No. Ultimate development stage. This is what we call the <coughs> what we call the Napier deltic. The Napier deltic engine, <coughs> as the deltic says, it's a kind of triangular engine. I'm trying to draw it first, and then you will see it. I try to draw a triangle like like this that stands on a peak and what happens around you get a lot of pistons in the system so here I'm trying to draw a crankshaft on each corner trying to draw a crankshaft on each corner and on the crankshafts, I'm drawing pistons. One piston, one cylinder. The second piston, I put it here. And I try to link it somehow. Let's say I link it there. So a second piston, I can link somewhere here. It seems like three range of V engines, three range of V engines, that are linked together. So here I can draw the remaining parts, mostly. You get also a piston here. Do you see more or less what I'm talking about? It's like having three V engine, one V engine here, a second V engine here, a third V engine here. <coughs> and you have inlet exhaust. You have inlet. Usually the inlet is inside for simplicity. <coughs> so I try to put it inside. I put the inlet inside like this. Inlet here. And maybe inlet here. Let's see. And exhaust here. Okay. So actually, you get three opposed piston engine in one unit. And all the crankshafts are linked with gears, all the three. OK, you get a huge compressor that fills in the internal triangle with air. And it, then it starts, and you are happy it works. It's incredibly noisy, really incredibly noisy. You get a complicated gear strain around. You get a roots compressor that is noisy itself to fill in the air inside. Plus you get cooling systems, three separate exhaust. It's incredibly noisy. <coughs> but 
it's a compact thing, it's a flat thing, and it's quite easy to <coughs> scale it. So by, by disks of, or by, tri by triangles, you can have one row, two, three, next to each other, up to maybe eight. So you can make a system of engines based on this principle. So here, one unit. is three or four cylinders. Three or four cylinders. And you had uh, engines, engines of three, four, and six units. depending on the power need. And the English wanted to have the smaller, the three to four units to put in locomotives and the larger four to six units into ships, smaller or medium sized ships. And the advantage was that it was a very compact, small engine for its power because it was fit in a quite close compartment, quite small compartment. Okay, so the advantage of this Deltic engine, it was the power to volume ratio. It was really small for its power. Disadvantage, unfortunately, a lot. Manufacturing cost. So it required a very complicated casting to have all the transfer ports, the place for the gear trains and so on. So it was expensive to make. It was incredibly noisy. So when they put it in locomotives, whole uh, streets were waken up at the start <laughs> on the morning of the engine. <laughs> it's really noisy if you have look at, if you look at the different videos. And it required an excellent material quality. that English people could not afford these times. These times I'm speaking about the 1950s, 1950s, 1960s, mostly 1950s. So this was the last of this opposed piston engine system. I know 1940s, 1950s. So this thing did not last long time unfortunately, but it's a very spectacular thing. Sometimes st spectacular things are catching and they remain. Sometimes they don't. This is an example of they don't. <laughs> okay. And Americans were much smarter or maybe they had much more practical sense and they were chosen a different way. They were chosen a different way. So maybe I will erase the next board. And I will present a more practical solution to that. That lasted more long time. And what is more common is the two stroke with valves. <laughs> How it happens? A diesel, yeah, with valves and two strokes. Sorry? 
uh, you get both valves and ports. So the question was, if there are no ports, just valves, I say there are both. Uh -huh. And the idea is the following. You get a regular cylinder, you get a piston as usual, you get here a crankshaft as usual, and you get a connecting dot somewhere here. So in the top, you get, for sure, you get a piston, a super, sorry, a valve. Here you get a valve that opens, that is opened or closed by a, a normal valve train. And this valve controls a way out of the cylinder. And when the, the piston is in the bottom dead center, then below, or not below, uh, on the lower part of the cylinder wall, you get a series of small holes. And these small holes are the inlet port. Okay, so remember that very important is that it's very important to have a, a uniform flow in the cylinder when you are exchanging the, 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 the gases and the fresh air. And so that it works, you need a compressor. I know it by K, it's a compressor. Okay, now do you see how it works? So if the piston moves down, it opens the inlet port and you get a compressor outside that pushes the air in quickly. But really quickly, because when the piston moves up, it will close this port and going up, making compression, combustion. And at the end of the combustion, you get a valve that opens, so you get only exhaust valves that opens. And the same logic, you get a uniform flow from the compressor to the exhaust. You can completely empty uh, the cylinder. You can uh, push away the exhaust gases by the fresh air. And then the, the piston closes the inlet ports and you can make compression and combustion. Okay. And this is a solution that still allows you to have good quality bearings below a good quality lubrication below, plus at a given uh, cylinder volume, a higher uh, power. Okay. So here you get exhaust uh, through valves, inlet through ports, compressor needed for scavenging, for filling up the cylinder and pushing out the exhaust gases. Usually this, is, this compressor is a roots compressor, again noisy, it's a roots compressor. And uh, the injection usually happens in cylinder head, as in a usual four-stroke engine. <coughs> this logic was developed by the General Motors. General Motors company, and is known as GMC diesel system. Again, in the same time, the Napier, Napier Deltic in the 50s, mostly, 1950s. It was used till 1980s, so for 30 years. 
The last engines like that were put in buses and trucks in the 80s, 82, 83, 85, till this, this, these dates. Okay. And the GMC was developing this engine mostly for trucks. Uh, tanks, if you have heard of Sherman tanks maybe, and uh, locomotives, and buses. If you get the typical Greyhound buses in the United States with the stainless steel body and the sloped window, for sure they get a two-stroke GMC engine inside. And we can add small ships. Fisher ships in this, this size. Okay. So we are at the 80s more or less now. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, this is not used anymore because the modern four-stroke engines with turbocharging are much better. But that time it was a very good way. And what is used and I haven't shown till and which is used still today and that are the most efficient, efficient internal combustion engines these days, they are still the two-strokes, but a particular kind of two-strokes. This particular type of engines are the big ship engines. And if I say sh big, they are really big, six to eight, nine meter tall engines. And uh, here on, in ships, we get a basic, we get a lot of requirements. The basic requirements that the RPM, the N, is below 80 and 120. Because this is the RPM range when you put the propeller directly on the shaft of the engine. So you don't need to have a supplementary gearbox on the ship. Okay. So how you can increase the power, possible power increase, if you are limited at the side of the RPM, you cannot have more. You can increase the stroke number. Cylinder number. And cylinder size. Cylinder size. And in ships, all this happen. So, number of cylinders. It's usually an uh, I'm seeking for the word odd. One, three, five, and so on. It's odd numbers. One, three, five, seven, nine cylinders are in a ship in a lane. So next to each other in a row. So cylinder diameter as in a ship 
there is plenty of plates, at least in the engine compartment. Both the stroke and bore are huge or large. To produce a lot of power. And if you get large bore and large stroke, you get large parts. I say diameter of one meter. <laughs> so you can enter the cylinder for cleaning it from inside. It's normal. You arrive, you arrive to the port, you made the, the Shanghai, I don't know, Liverpool round, around Africa, for sure. And you arrive after some, some weeks. And the first thing to do when you are at the shore, to enter into the cylinder with your small hammer and cleaning the tar and coke from inside. Because you can enter the cylinder. It's so huge. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So you get heavy parts. So you get large or huge blah, 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 mass forces, high dynamical forces. And for this reason, the arrangement of the ship engines have kept the arrangement of the large steam engines. So the parts are identical or more or less completed, completely uh, have same function because of the size. And to show it shortly, I erase the, last, this, the board the last time, I hope. So a ship engine, a large ship engine, I in, yeah. I would repeat this, not a small one, but a large one. It has a structure similar to a usual steam engine. Namely, you get a crank. You get a crankshaft. You get a connecting rod. And you get what we call, and which is usual in a steam engine, this thing is called a crosshead. And the crosshead is required to support the lateral forces because they are so huge. You cannot support it by the piston. And then you get usually a flat disc piston or more or less a flat disc piston plus a further part that is a uh, heritage of the steam machines. This part here, the gray or uh, the green one. The green one is called piston rod. And the blue was called the crosshead. And what about the cylinder? The cylinder is just here. If you remember locomotives, and you see locomotives, steam locomotives, at the level of the wheels, you get the rods going further and backwards. These are the piston rods. And you can also see the cross head on the level of the wheels of a steam locomotive. And we got the same parts for our ship diesel engine, two-stroke diesel engine. And you get a disc-shaped piston. Disc-shaped piston. If you get a disc-shaped piston,
what you have. Above the piston, you may have the scavenging ports. You may have the exhaust valve. You may have the exhaust valve here. As for GMC engine, but it's much larger. So to increase power, what you can do, usually combustion above the piston. GMC style. Okay. What to do below? You can have either a piston compressor function for making the compressed air to scavenge the combustion chamber, or if you get external compressor, a large one, then you may have a second combustion chamber. And in this case, second scavenging port and valves and a larger piston to cover the scavenging port. Okay. But in this case, you get a quite important heat load. Because combustion here, combustion there, combustion here, combustion there, it's really hot. The piston is really hot. And allow me to finish this shortly. Properties. Unidirectional load on the piston. So the piston is always pressed from above because either there's work stroke or there's compression, practically. So often it's just bolted on <laughs> the piston rod. Usually you get high thermal load So you get cooling pipes in the piston. For sure, cooling is required. Cooling can be by oil, jet, So you get a nozzle that uh, gives an oil uh, flow against the piston surface from below, or cooling pipes inside the piston, either with water or oil. 
So inside the piston, you get cooling pipes, <laughs> a circular cooling conduct, or yeah, 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 and you get a split piston. You get head in cast iron that supports the heat quite well and you get the piston skirt the lateral surface in aluminium that is good for sliding head in cast iron skirt in aluminium and in ships as they are working at constant rpms the power regulation cannot be done by a simple way or by changing the fuel quantity in the cylinder. Instead, they just switch on or off cylinders. So if you need small power, you get just one cylinder working. All are moving, but just one is working. If you need more, you switch on a second. If you need even more power, you switch on the third. All are moving. But maybe the exhaust valve is just always uh, opened, so there's no combat, and the comb and the fuel injection is closed. Okay, so it's typical for ships. So power regulation. Power control by switching. of cylinders. If you leave, even you don't have to leave open the exhaust valve, but you have to switch off the switch off the, the injection of the fuel, and that's okay. So ship engines are quite different <laughs> in size and technology, but still two-stroke engines, they can have efficiency up to 50% which is a peak value from an internal combustion engine, 50%. In a passenger car, normally you get, we are around 30, 25 to 30%. Mac the question was if it's the, the maximum efficiency. Uh, for the internal combustion engines, actually we are around 50% of maximum efficiency that we can make today and the large two-stroke ship engines with Crosshead and company, these engines are the most efficient. Even if they are working, the fuel is more or less tar, or very thick black material that has to be heated up to 80 to 100 degrees Celsius to be fluid. <laughs> so if you see a cargo ship and it's accelerating, you get a large quantity of uh, greasy black, black smoke that goes out of the ship, and this makes a huge air pollution. Much higher than an airplane with its uh, gas turbines. But as nobody lives in the middle of the sea, till now nobody was watching. But these days when we are, always, we are even uh, looking suspect to, to the cause because they are producing methane. So a large ship like this cannot hide. So more and more ships are converted to gas, natural gas. Spark ignition, auto cycle, this size, but natural gas. If you get a huge gas tanker that transport gas from, I don't know, from Iran to, to England, or from Iran to Africa, you have to leave out a quantity of gas because the tanks are heating up on the sun. And this gas is either left out to keep the pressure at a safe level, or you put it in your ship engine directly. So you decrease your losses of gas, you decrease your pollution emission, 
and you are operating the ship at a lower cost. Okay? So ship engines, these kind of ship engines, two-stroke ship engines are used still today and they are the science up to date. Uh, Swiss people are quite expert and Swedish people also. German, Swedish and Swiss are expert in, in building such large en engines. You get Sulzer in, in Switzerland, you get Wartzilla in Sweden, and you have MAN maybe in Germany for making such large engines. Practically the ship is built around the engine. When they get to the deck level where they have to put the engine, they put the engine inside and then they continue the building of the ship around. Uh, I've got students that regularly go work for Varsila, for the Swedish uh, ship engine maker. So they went in the ship in Sydney, in Australia. They make the reparations why the engine is working and the ship is going to Johannesburg, for example. And at Johannesburg, they leave the ship, the reparations made. If you imagine changing a valve, exhaust valve, for example, in a storm, when the ship engine is working and just the given cylinder is switched off, and the valve is like this and weights, let's say, three tons. Plus you get the ship flying left side, right side, left side, right side, with front, back, front, back, depending on the wave's orientation. So being a ship mechanic, serious job, serious job. Okay, so thank you for your patience. I apologize for this short, or for this long, long uh, presentation. I wanted to sh stop during this, okay. And for the tests, you get tests at this afternoon at five o'clock. You have a time window of 20 minutes for the test and you make it on our uh, Moodle system, educa online education system, okay? Good, so I finish for today. And this part will be a part for the next test in, in three weeks, two weeks, we will complete it. Thank you for the attention. Thank you.